Welcome to Ahead of the Game, a podcast brought to you by the Digital Marketing Institute. This episode is a big Q&A, where we explore an area of marketing through a leading industry expert. I'm your host, Will Francis, and today I'll be talking to Brian Corish, all about digital transformation. Brian is Managing Director of Accenture Interactive in the Austria, Switzerland, Germany, and Russia region. Brian is an award-winning tech entrepreneur and has held senior digital roles at Bank of Ireland, Vodafone, and the creative agency TBWA. Brian actually joined us for a webinar on this very subject recently, along with Barry Thomas, Head of Customer Marketing and Future of Commerce at Coca-Cola. And that was a fascinating discussion too. So you can watch the replay of that at digitalmarketinginstitute.com. Anyway, Brian, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. I've been looking forward to this. It's good to have you on because, yes, digital transformation is clearly quite a big and important topic <laughs> and uh, one that's affecting a lot of businesses. Just um, just tell me, what is it that you do at Accenture and, and how does that end up impacting the, the businesses that are your clients? <laughs> so this week, um, no, in, in Accenture, what I do is I... Uh, work across Austria, Switzerland, Germany, Russia. So we have some very large clients for Accenture Interactive. And my role is sort of, the, the term is an experience architect. So what we do is, is, is Accenture is probably the largest, no, it is the largest uh, company of its type in the world in that there's, we have 600 and something thousand people. And I describe it as the largest toy set in the world. It's got everything from amazing artificial intelligence to some of the best creative agencies in the world. Uh, I mean, my boss is a guy called Dave Droga, who's the most awarded creative, uh, I think, in history. Um, and what we do is, what I do is kind of look at everything from brand strategy to creative to the muscle that is Accenture, the ability to kind of scale and run things. Um, and I work with clients to kind of figure out what's their their point of differentiation. How can we how can we create cool experiences, and then how do I plug in all the parts of Accenture to build them? So we work with eighty three, I think, of oh no, as of this week, eighty four of the top one hundred brands in the world. So most of the digital experiences that you see from the largest brands in the world are typically built by Accenture. So I get the exciting role of kind of running around a massive organization with loads of really cool toys and getting to plug them together to build cool new experiences. That sounds really interesting. So are you talking about things like, um, you know, innovative apps, web experiences, digital outdoor, uh, you know, sort of cross media stuff like, like that, AR, are we talking that kind of thing? Everything from, we're literally currently working with uh, some large companies that will have to remain nameless that that we're building the metaverse for uh mm -hmm. we're doing really cool stuff with ar and vr artificial intelligence is massive uh helping organizations migrate to the cloud but then figure out what to do with it so it's not just a case of just taking what you have and put it in the cloud it's sort of okay well now you're there and you've got this amazing infrastructure how can we build these cool experiences uh through to scaling e-commerce through to uh marketing operations so helping really really large brands just where it's really hard to, to get people and to, to put operating models in place we do that so what what what's the big challenge for them what why do they need you where are they getting stuck most commonly um well what we do is is change and transformation that's what accenture does um and where it, it can be loads of things but depending on the industry i mean it kind of typically where we try to move clients from is, is I think over over the past, I'll probably get in trouble for saying it, but over the past uh, you know 15 years when we spoke about digital transformation, it was let's replace technology with new technology and then we're transformed somehow. Um, where clients are trying to figure out now is, well, how do I kind of create competitive differentiation? And that requires creativity. And what's interesting is is over the last couple of years uh creativity has previously been sort of creative agencies that sat over making ads and and they you've got brilliantly creative people there but they were never allowed near 
the tech stack of the business or the product function of the business. So what we do is, well, we've been doing the tech stack of the business for a very long time. And Interactive is the largest digital agency in the world. I mean, it's 10.6 billion a year in revenue and I think around 60,000 people. Um, so we're kind of taking creativity and technology and putting them together. And that's, that's what we do. So the, the challenge that a lot of clients have is, okay, we're going through this journey of digital transformation uh, that's been accelerated in 2020. Um, what do we do? Where do we start? And it, it's increasing. We're saying, well, it would, let's not start with technology. Let's not start with, hey, let's replace all your systems. Let's just start with mm. how's your operating model, your culture. I mean, and we we do this stuff ourselves. I was, I'm, I mean, I'm relatively new to Accenture, but like really cool stuff like the onboarding in Accenture now is done in virtual reality because of the pandemic. You can't go anywhere. Mm. So they send you a headset and you've got this really cool metaverse where you actually virtually network with people and, and all of the systems in Accenture, which is probably something we should talk about more. Uh, are amazing. I mean, everything is powered by artificial intelligence in, right. in the back end. So that sort of stuff of like helping organizations understand what is digital transformation and how are they going to be competitively different when they when they do that. If they want to just go and replace a billing system, I don't know, talk to someone else. Yeah, that that's interesting that. I didn't really realize that because yes, you're right. Accenture's become from a place of having all the being great at the nuts and bolts stuff and the tech stack stuff, the infrastructure. And so they've realized, I suppose, over the years as an opportunity to then, they're really well placed to actually kind of execute on um, digital creativity. Whereas you're right, and I've I've been there, I've, I've worked in and I've run an agency that was very much about innovation. And, and it's hard because you're chipping around the edge. It's like you're not quite allowed in the, in the castle you're trying to make the castle better, <laughs> you, you know, and you just end up putting really pretty flags on the castle rather than actually being allowed across the moat, you know? That's a really good analogy because that's literally, I had the same experience, right? You're in a creative agency mm. and you really smart creative people who come up with ideas for the client of here's some, and they, they understand the brand and here's how we could change the brand. And uh, then you kind of go to the organization. They're like, um, your guys are creative agencies. You make ads keep away from our, 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 our technology stack, keep away from it. Cause you, you guys don't understand all of these processes and the structure that's required. Whereas what the, I think the really smart move that Accenture have done is combine the two, right? They've, they've, mm. they have, have all of the credibility of we can run and scale things globally. We're the biggest in the world at it, but also let's like the acquisitions that they've made in terms of creative agencies, they some are the best of the world. I mean, Droga five, I think, I was always kind of a secret fan before Droga 5 was yeah. bought by Accenture is the standard of like one of the best agencies in the world. So what we're doing now, and it's, 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 it's different cultures kind of mixing is like, how do you get a bunch of like creative people and a bunch of kind of process oriented people because you need both of them and stick them together. Right? So that, that's the hard part. Um, and that's the part that clients are going to have problems with too, right? Is you, at the center yes. of digital transformation, you need that creativity. You need that thing that makes your brand different. Those people, because uh, I, I think I probably land in that camp more than the process thing. My wife would definitely say I land in that camp more than the process thing if you see the state of my room. Um, but uh, th th those people, they, they think differently. And if you're in a big organization, how do you acquire those people? How do you retain them? Mm -hmm. How do you create uh, like a career timeline? So if I'm a creative director, like there's only so far, or if I'm a UX designer or a developer, there's only so far I get in certain types of organizations. And it's like, oh, you're kind of stuck now. Whereas within yeah. Accenture, it's sort of like, well, you can keep going because we figured that stuff out. But it's it's going to take clients years to do that, to, trans to kind of change their model that way from marketing is a bunch of guys over there that do some nice ads, but like mm. they're not making it to C-suite anytime soon. I know that you you say well it's not just about implementing new technology but the the the, the fact that technology is always changing that is the kind of nature of the opportunity right that is the source of the opportunity for some stuff you know for instance we see AR still you know AR and VR still kind of burgeoning and it's that kind of first mover advantage and all that kind of thing so is that is that a source of opportunity in your eyes um it depends on where you're coming at it from, right? So it's a source of threat if I'm a very large organization. Mm. 
Um, and what I mean by that is if you look at the cloud and you look at SaaS in the last decade, if I'm a startup within 24 hours with you know, my credit card, I can have the same or better infrastructure than most large enterprises have because I just go to a GCP instance or I go to uh, Azure or AWS and I have a scalable cloud infrastructure yeah. that's charged, that, that costs me next to nothing until I scale. That was usually a, a kind of a, a barrier for entry to, for large organizations, right? They had, they had to invest tens of millions or hundreds of millions in their technology because they had to scale. And, and if you're yeah. a small startup, you, when, certainly when I had my startups, I, you couldn't compete with those guys. You were like, we, we can't build that infrastructure. We'd have to raise hundreds of millions of dollars. Whereas now I can literally just you hop on, on Google and switch it on. And, mm. and, I'm, and that's a threat if I'm a big company because they have legacy infrastructure. If I'm a bank, I've probably been around the, you know, 50, 100 years. And I have all of these different systems that have been built over time. It makes me slower because they're all on-premise and I need to move them to the cloud. Whereas a fintech can scale up and start taking my customers quickly. And it takes years to compete. So it's a threat. You know, yeah, emerging technology is an opportunity. I, I was in augmented reality in 2011, um, way too early. It was raw. Yeah. And the, the, the hardware wasn't ready. It wasn't there yet. So it was cool, but it was useless. <laughs> so whereas now you're starting to see kind of practical uses for it. It's being put into cars. Your, your satellite navigation is literally put up on, on your windscreen in a lot of cars. You've heads up displays, you're starting to see practical uses. So uh, my very roundabout answer is it's both an opportunity and a, and a threat. But I think organizations get a bit too caught up in the technology and they forget what they're, the point of deploying the technology, which is either adding customer value uh, mm. that gives me competitive advantage that grows my company. I'm, I'm interested in this legacy thing because, you know, how, how do you handle innovation at a company that has a huge body of like legacy systems? Do you just go off and create completely separate ancillary stuff, experiences and systems you know, without spending five years plugging that into the, all the legacy stuff, can you can you do that? Can, but then you end up with disjointed customer experiences at some point, right? So yeah. you can build this beautiful app over here, and then uh, you know, if I just take banking as an example, now I want to yeah. log in and check my accounts. Oh wait, no, that doesn't talk to that thing, and that kind of falls over. Um, but I mean, the the approach that we're advocating for, I mean, we've got service design agencies like Fjord, and then here in in ASGR, we have a company called Cinder Schrader who, is, who are building digital experiences for some very large uh, automotive companies in Germany. Um, yeah. Those guys, what we're trying to do is say, look, let's start with uh, understanding the, the, the customer need and reinventing the experience around it, uh, not making it better not just iteratively making it better, which is where organizations have gotten stuck for a while. And then let's light some fires. So let's start with little prototypes to make sure the kind of the thing that we're building is the right thing. And if it isn't, having the courage to kill it fast. And that can happen in isolation, can't it? That prototyping, the MVP, you know, can be just done in the lab, as it were. Organizations haven't had to operate that way before, and they couldn't, right? They're these big legacy infrastructure. So the product team would come up with an idea that they think is right they do some research beforehand and then off it went to someone in it who had to go build a thing and it would take them two years to build it because they're building it on all these clunky systems and integrating everything then they release it to market and realize oh nobody really wanted it and and there's a huge amount of wasted money there so yeah. if you can kind of rapidly try things and that's look that's what cloud allows you to do ultimately but you can do it before then um, to make sure that okay, the things we're going to have to kind of throw over the fence and build are the right things. They are the things that customers actually care about. Mm. Uh, that's where I think there's a lot of confusion over agile, right? So every organization that you speak to is going, oh, we're going to be agile and we're, we're following, you know, we're, we're looking, we're, we're loads of scrum masters and loads. And I was like, okay, but how, how are you, how are you determining what's of customer value and how are you killing stuff that isn't? And that's usually where 
well, we've built a new app and we did it in a series of sprints, but nobody actually spoke to a customer in the meantime. And uh, well, nobody's using it. Like it's that sort of... Yeah, I think that's the first major watch out with digital transformation to flag up for listeners, isn't it? That it's, it's unless it's customer centric, um, which is an easy thing to say, but you know, it's a hard thing to really kind of stick, stay true to. Unless it's customer centric, you're right. It's, it's, um, it's useless and it's the wrong thing to do. Yeah, start with the assumption you're totally wrong. Is a good way to start, right? So, mm-hmm. so go talk to customers, and and you you know, there's loads of methodologies, but it doesn't really. I don't really get caught up in them. It's design thinking this week, and then it's some other one lean lean out in the next week, and it, it's it's more about is the customer behavior changing? So, is the thing we're deploying changing customer behavior? Are users actually changing their behavior as a result of the thing that we've released? And if they're not, well, then it's kind of a vanity metric. We've done it for the sake of ourselves. And and yes. you can use design thinking to kind of find what are those hidden needs, the things that customers don't really, can't really articulate, but they, they it's a problem. But they they mightn't tell you in research. But if you observe them doing something, you can figure, oh, there's a problem there. And then that's where you bring in the creative people who go, okay, well, let's just reinvent that change the entire experience around that thing. And now let's go see if we were right. And probably 80% of the time we were wrong. And that's where, you know, there's a huge cultural change in organizations there because in a lot of places, it's not okay to kind of say, yeah, I spent six months on this thing and actually it's a disaster that doesn't work. <laughs> and, and, and because you're kind of rewarded by, by, by pushing forward the best stories. Right? So it's that culture of, you know, they always say fail fast and it's not, it's learning, right? It's that culture of how do you, how do you launch something? How do you test if it's working and how do you, when it's not have an, have a culture where people can go, actually that was, that didn't work, but we learned these things for the next one. Yes, and, exactly. Yeah. And, and people are rewarded for that. That's, that's a huge shift. Yeah. Hello, a quick reminder from me that if you're enjoying our podcast series, why not become a member of the DMI so that you can enjoy loads more content from webinars and case studies to toolkits and more real life insights from the world of digital marketing. Head to digitalmarketinginstitute.com forward slash ahead of the game, sign up for free. Now back to the podcast. So it's sounding like we're skirting around some of these things, but just give me the kind of what are the main pillars of digital transformation? I'm picking up things about culture, things about technology and prototyping. Sort of just for the listeners thinking, right? Okay, what, what does what is the, what are the main kind of moving parts of digital transformation? Just lay that out for us in sort of simple terms. You you can kind of break it down into two parts, and and I've been trying to articulate it for years really badly. Um, and it's actually when I when I got when I got to Accenture, I saw a, a piece of work, and it was called Business of Experience. And I was like, "That's what I've been trying to say for the last couple of years." And there's sort of two parts, right? There's there's uh, what's what every organization has been on this journey of customer experience and CX, and and there's this other narrative that's called Business of Experience, which is how do you customer experience is all about uh, touch point optimization. Right. So, so digital transformation has been around how do we make things more, more efficient, essentially, is how, how digital transformation has been viewed for the last number of years. So mm-hmm. how do we make our marketing more efficient? Well, we do that through marketing automation, and we do that through better targeting. We do that through CDPs or DMPs, and we get really efficient at our marketing. And then, well, let's look at our, our customer customer journey and omni-channel customer journey. Well, it's about like a single view of a customer and then it's about making that more efficient. But it's really been, been about efficiency to save cost. So that's the first phase of where digital transformation has been. I think 2020 has really been the tipping point where brands have realized, okay, we need to do that stuff because customer expectations continually improving but uh, are changing, but it's not providing us with any differentiation. We're running to keep still. Right. We're, we're getting better every year and brands are getting better every year and customer experience is getting better, better every year. But there are very few brands that are really kind of radically differentiating. So that's kind of the next phase of digital transformation is how do you take the money you've saved through all of this efficiency stuff and reallocate it and double down on, on, on 
innovation that will drive huge competitive advantage for you. And yes. that's where there's a real kind of shift in how digital digital transformation, the thinking around digital transformation needs to happen. I mean, you've seen like over the past kind of 20, 25 years, we've seen a, a huge shift in how brands kind of need to operate to remain competitive, right? I could be contentious and say a lot of them haven't transformed mm -hmm. enough. I mean, when I grew up in sort of the 80s and 90s, you could build a pretty crappy product and you could lean on the industrial advertising complex to provide you with that yeah. differentiation, right? So, uh, you know, smart people in Soho or, or Madison Avenue, they came up with these brilliant campaigns and then, you know, and, and through budget, basically taking over TV and cinema and outdoor, you could convince people that your car or your jeans or your washing powder was the best or made them look the sexiest or whatever. And mm -hmm wasn't the case but kind of and then along came this kind of great arbiter of brands which was the internet and with kind of a few one-star reviews all of your hard work is just gone so so what's happened is is products have gotten better because you kind of have to i mean you you can't it's very hard to buy a car now that breaks down all the time uh, whereas that was that was perfectly fine in the nineties, <laughs> you know, like you, the, the the worst smartphone you pick up now has got a really good battery and a decent camera, mm -hmm. and you know, there, there's no bad products anymore. So we've we've all we've all benefited from that. The challenge is there are a few brands that have figured out actually the product is getting iteratively better every year. It's the experience around the product that is where we differentiate and those brands just dominate the industries that they they come into and you see kind of this is really was the trigger for where digital transformation started you saw brands like netflix coming in and just yeah products the same but we're going to do personalization and the, the value they're giving to customers I mean, you can't compete with netflix now if you're mm -hmm. a media brand it's like well i expect to have billions of dollars of content every year for a tenner a month <laughs> like it's just how do you compete with those guys so what they've done is they've reinvented the the experience and they've looked at innovation around the experience yes and they continue to do that i think that's what's interesting about netflix is they don't stop they keep just really trying to lower the amount of friction they're always on the attack for looking for points of friction and just addressing those so you know, making it easy to find something to watch, to easy to connect with the things that are likely to be relevant to you. And they've really, uh, they you know, they didn't stop when they got all those movies into a, a digital interface. No, and that, that's where, that's what's what's fascinating about those brands. I mean, you, you can be lazy and say Apple, but actually Apple are pretty good at copying other people. Um, but it, it like those experience-led brands, you know, even if you look at Uber as an example, I know that they, they're not they're not uh, profitable. But if you look at what they did, I mean, nobody uh, do taxi ranks even exist anymore. I'm not entirely sure <laughs> in small towns. Yeah, but it, 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 they they didn't change the fundamental product initially, but the experience of booking it, they changed that. And then they went, OK, now you're in the car. Well, you can book, pay, play your music and then you can set the climate before you get into the car. And then they went into Uber Eats. And then they went into like, they, they're continuously about experience reinvention and not experience iterative improvement. So so that's the longest answer ever. <laughs> but when you talk about digital transformation, I think the first generation of digital transformation has been around iterative improvement or efficiency. That the, the next challenge companies have is, well, how do we take the money we've saved and stop just passing it back to a shareholder in terms of dividends and then go, let's double down and reinvent the experience. I mean, some companies that have done this really well, Disney did this really well. Like Disney was theme parks mm -hmm. and the, the occasional movie, like they moved into Disney plus and really began to sort of eat into the streaming business. And you see their share price going way up. They, they've kind of figured that out, right? They figured out actually we're in the business of kind of entertainment and happiness. And how do we, how do we reinvent experiences with that as our North star? But a lot of companies are kind of stuck in the efficiency part. How do we improve MPS? How do we make our call centers more efficient? Cool. That's okay. But I, I saw a statistic recently, I think is it Gen Z? I hate generalizing by generations, but, uh, I think 57% of them would prefer to go to a dentist than go to, than call a call center. 
than to deal with an IVR. They just, just don't want to do it. So you can be as efficient as you, possible as you want to be, but nobody wants to call you in the first place. So mm-hmm. how do you reinvent that experience? That's a good no, that's a good point. I mean, just to kind of push you a bit on this, let's say that um, uh, I... I'm a listener and I'm like, okay, great. Yeah, Netflix, Disney, they're, they're great. But I run a florist, right, in a medium-sized town or city. You know, ca- ca- is, is digital transformation on, on the table there for, for a business like that? And, and what kind of things, you know, should those small businesses be looking to? Yes, because you look at the, the same thing, right? So you look at the customer the customer. The customer journey isn't the right word but the, the mm. how, how customers consume your product essentially and you look at experience reinvention around that that will provide you with differentiation so if you're a florist look at the distribution model do people have to go into your flower shop uh which yeah, currently given all the lockdowns could be a bit of a challenge if you look at subscription models people want why do buy people buy flowers well they want nice flowers in their house could you look at uh building a a, a subscription model where every every month you pay a certain amount of month and every month depending on the season we send you flowers so we send you different types of flowers for your house or we cor- we color coordinate the, the flowers that you have in your house based on the decor in your house and you can use mm-hmm. you can start to use machine vision there and you can start to use recommendation engines so it's it's not about the they, like the great thing about the time we live in now is pretty much anything's possible with technology. Um, it's the kind of the the creativity, the creative solutions that will give your florist competitive differentiation over yes. and, and and over anyone else. And it may not be a digital thing. I mean, there's a bookstore in um, London, and bookstores, you know. Jeff uh, Bezos, having the world's largest midlife crisis, has demolished um, bookstores. Right, Amazon. The idea of you don't you don't go to bookstores anymore, except these guys figured out that. Well, what if we do curated recommendations specifically for you, based on our understanding of you? So we talk to you. It's, it's a very personal thing where we talk to you. We understand the books you like, you don't like. We're not using personalization and recommendation. No algorithms. Nothing. And they just, and we, we will package these books for you because we know these are the exact type of books you like, mm. and we'll send them to you every, every week or every month. And it, they charge, I think a thousand pounds a year for that service. And they are booked out bad, bad pun, wow. but they not intended, but they, they, they are re, their, their business is transformed because if they decided we're going to be online too, we're going to compete with Amazon. They don't have hope of competing with Amazon. So it's understanding yeah. what makes your brand different in their case, uh, their people is what made their brand different. They're, yes. They were proper. They read constantly reading books and their their understanding of their customer. But it's a digitally available product, presumably, as well. You know, So they still had to articulate that through, through technology and make that subscription available online and what have you. So, But very um, high touch, very, very yeah. personal. They speak yeah. to you. They are bookworms themselves. They really understand yeah. them. It's not just, hey, other people like you like this. It, it, it's really, they get to really understand the things you love about books and love about specific authors. And then yeah. they go and find the books for you. It sounds really rudimentary. Talk to your customer. <laughs> it's just, how many years yeah. have we been saying this? And can we always find some excuse not to? Oh, it's all about data. No, just talk to your customer. No, it's all about AI. Again, talk to your customer. Yeah, customer insight is crucial. I mean, it's like the florist thing. You know, I was just Googling there and there's a brand I see all the time called Bloom and Wild. And um, they've done incredibly well over the last couple of years because they created this product, Letterbox Flowers. And presumably it's based on the insight that people worry about sending flowers and someone might not be in and the flowers get left outside the door. And so they've basically created a piece of packaging that somehow keeps the flowers fresh, fits through a letterbox and that has been their thing. And then on top of that, yeah, they created a really slick e-commerce store, um, probably through something like Shopify, but they've done insanely well. And so, you know, it can be that. And it's, it's again, based on that, that customer insight, customer concern, customer fear, uh, what's keeping your customers up at night, what do your customers really want? And you're right, it's all about talking to them, listening to them. Um, Br- Brian, I've got to ask you, how did you get to where you are like and and how and what are the differences because you you were building startups and now you 
I suppose at the other end of the spectrum, working for one of the world's big businesses, how how did that trajectory happen, and what have you kind of brought with you along the way? Through a series of fortunate accidents, I think is how my career is has has turned out. Uh, I, yeah, I started in startups, tech startups, uh, with my own uh, companies through just simply observation. Um, realized that kind of I was a DJ, that's how I started, and started looking at restaurants and bars and got to know the owners and they're all like well we, yeah it's a it's a real pain sorting out our music and not having that right and then stores same problem and then we started to build a company out of that that started to use computer systems that essentially emulated what a dj would do would understand where it was and what crowd would be there and would play music and then we went well a lot of these places have screens we should probably do some ads on screens for them and this became a digital signage network um so when i sold that we end, i ended up in um building kind of creative solutions to brand for brand experiences so that's that's what we did just like look at what was discretionary budget at the time this being 2007 2008 not really digital was not a thing and going what how could we kind of create these amazing brand experiences with kind of bleeding edge technology which is how i know so much about being way too early in the market with certain types of technology but um did you do any Bluetooth marketing? Oh, God, yeah. And then you say, how, how do you get people to, to leave their Bluetooth on? Because the batteries are crap on phones at the time. Yeah. And they used to just switch them off. Um, but now it's on all the time, so it's fine. But yes, I did. So I, I'm, I'm very familiar with being too early to the market with technology. Um, but it was always about kind of this, this kind of what I'm trying to do is, is, is create interesting and exciting experiences, right? So for 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 people i mean it's i i think was i saying this before djing is probably the worst job you can ever start your career with because you turn up and expect like you know turn up and everything and expect oh there's a thousand people just going nuts because i'm playing music how why why would i turn up to the office does this not happen um so so it's always look how do you kind of put creativity and technology together uh, i've had a weird career i mean i've gone from there into creative agencies where i saw the kind of the limitations of brilliantly creative people who I realized very quickly I'm not that creative when you talk to these 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 people who are kind of shoehorned into go make a TV ad or go make a display ad and and you're just seeing that industry and I, I was there around 2012 and, and and just seeing what was going to happen to that industry which has mm -hmm. I mean you're seeing the the industrial advertising complex kind of collapsing upon itself at the moment mm -hmm. um to into okay i'm going to try this in big companies i'm going to try in in vodafone and telcos and how and you realize they're they're big ships to turn right they're really difficult to to get a, an entire industry or a massive player because it, it, it's it's just if, to the points we spoke about earlier you've huge amounts of infrastructure and millions of customers and it's not as easy as i thought of i well, just create this thing and we'll just launch it and so it's always been about kind of trying to drive in that change which is how i've ended up through a, a series of kind of debates with very very smart people in accenture <laughs> working in accenture <laughs> is, is this because I, I i think it's kind of i've landed in somewhere where i can kind of be creative and see the 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 impact of of what you're doing and having a having a machine like with 600 not thousand people being able to build some of my more harebrained ideas um yeah i don't know i've had a very strange career that's nice no that's 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 nice that you're able to to do that to see those things executed you know um and that must be really satisfying um so but what I suppose, what have you brought with you from startup life? Like, what wouldn't you know if you hadn't worked? You know, you hadn't had those startups. I'm yeah, I'm. But I've learned a lot in large organizations. I mean, what I I figured out in startups was the, the point we were talking about earlier. Just talk to your customer because we had mm. no budget. Uh, we could barely pay our bills. We set up, and mm. we were building stuff that nobody had seen before. So, if you didn't talk to the customer, being the end client at the time you you didn't have a business you couldn't pay your mortgage so we were literally co-creating with our customers going talk to them going do you want this no that's not exactly right okay but back in a week do you want this no that's it. and when i when i figured out when you join really large companies is there are so many layers in the company that as companies of scales you have to do that uh that that quite often the people who talk to customers most 
usually store pe people working in stores or people yeah. working in call centers are a couple of layers removed from the people who are building the products or doing the marketing. And my kind of thing from, from startups, which is really simplistic, is how do you put that customer, to getting people to go talk to customers again. And yeah. when you do that, the innovation starts really quickly. Organizations start to realize, oh, yeah, yeah didn't think about that. And, and it's so I, know, I, I hate this idea of these uh, unicorn, super creative people who, who kind of, you know, that this idolatry that we have of all these innovators, Elon Musk and his bunch of flying monkeys is driving me a bit crazy at the moment. Um, <laughs> you know, like he's, yes, he's, he's, a, he's a very smart person. I hate the fact that he takes credit for everything that Tesla does. It's not him. Mm. He's got brilliantly smart engineers. He's got mm. brilliantly smart user experience designers who are attracted to the brilliant brand he's built, but it's not about that. I mean, anyone is, can be creative. They just need to be kind of closer to customers and understand that. So that's my learning I brought to big companies. What big companies have taught me is, yeah, you with your smart, your startup ideas, there's, there's a lot of structure that needs to be put into place to make that oh, yeah. work at scale. Okay. Well, look, I, I can see time's ticking. We've got eight minutes till the, the, that we're on the hour. So um, there's a couple of important things I want to ask you because I want to get get in here. The first one is, I know we, we talked about this in the, in the webinar a little bit, but what would you say to listeners who are becoming aware they need to you know implement some some sort of digital transformation in their company uh, what would you say to those people as a sort of way to get started as sort of a critical path to get started with a digital transformation project um start with really understanding your brand start with really understanding and it's usually if not usually but quite regularly left out is digital mm -hmm. transformation typically starts in technology and it starts yes. with, hey, we need to replace this thing. Quick, let's replace this thing. And the business we need case to do AR. Sense. Yeah. Why? I, I don't know. It's cool. Um, but but if you start with your brand, uh, usually the marketing team or the brand team are typically pretty close to the customer. And they should fundamentally understand the brand's DNA and what makes the brand different. And if you then translate that to the the the, the uh transformation you're undergoing that's where you get your competitive differentiation porsche is an example of that uh, they understand their dna they understand what makes them different and what's always made porsche different is uh repeatability of performance they could keep doing the same thing over and over again and then you could drive home and where other cars would have blown up and and it's about the driving experience when porsche made an electric car they made one that drives like a porsche when mm -hmm. lots of other manufacturers made an electric car they made one trying to be like tesla Whereas Porsche, and it's done really well for them, have said, no, no, we're going to keep the DNA of what makes our brand different. And we're going to apply that to new technology using new technology. That's the, the start. And it's usually the part people that are left out, the, the marketing team and the brand team that are the people who help you create that North Star for what you're trying to do and how it's going to be different and how it's going to give you competitive advantage. Nobody in the organization cares other than the C-suite about your, your margin next year. Everyone yeah. cares about why would I stay in this organization? Well, that's the North Star for what are we trying to do for society? What are we trying to do for our customers? What are we trying to do for our colleagues? And if you can kind of articulate that, everything else becomes a lot easier. And you, I remember talking in the webinar, you talked about how, you know, you really stressed the point that digital transformation isn't just about technology. Actually, the big, the, the transformation is really a transformation of mindset and culture and that's what anybody listening is going to find themselves pushing against. So not like wrangling with bits of tech and get them, getting them implemented, but actually kind of changing the culture in people's minds, right? Yeah, hugely. I mean, and, and you know, you've heard of the last couple of years about purpose-led brands and what that means mm. and purpose. Did, did, where that's kind of fallen down quite a lot is, is we, we talk about purpose and then it's handed over to the marketing department, right? So you guys go talk about our purpose. And, and here's our new purpose. Let's do. Let's talk to internal comms and have loads of loads of presentations about our purpose, with some guest speakers talking about our purpose, not people who work in the organisation. And and that where where in digital transformation, that kind of setting a north star, of here's what we're trying to do. That's going to be, that's going to get people excited. Why would I want to work for you as a company? That 
part will start to shift the culture. Look, you're not going to bring everybody. There's going to be people who've, who are scared of change. I mean, actually, when you think most of us really are a little scared of change, <laughs> but yeah. uh, it, it, it's that kind of, this is where we're going. This is what it means for you and your career. These are the things you can do uh, to, to, to kind of transform and learn new skills as we move forward, because everybody's going to have to learn new skills. If you yeah. cannot continue to do your job the same way, because just everything is changing so quickly. Most of the roles that are important now are didn't exist 10 years ago. Yeah. So upskilling is kind of a big part of it as well, isn't it? Huge. And, and st- Again, my 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 bone of contention with unicorns is this: stop. You know, you w- there will be external skill sets you need to hire, and there will be different skill sets you need to hire. But don't forget the people who work in your organization; like they become less shiny somehow when they're in the organization. It's how do you bring those people along? How do you train those people? How do you it, like? Because trying to acquire the, the best new uh, digital analytics talent, or, or f- for example yeah good luck <laughs> you get it for a while it's really how do you how do you kind of help the people internally understand that and how do you how do you upskill them and how do you make it less scary right so yeah. it's it, there's going to be change yeah but it's going to be positive for everyone here as opposed to negative and that change isn't always i mean we talk about digital transformation and the, the conversation naturally tends towards the big flashy kind of new technologies but it's not always about that, is it? It could be about, you know, quite, quite kind of, and it usually is about quite mundane sounding stuff, the lower level stuff, the changing our CRM system, changing our, you know, uh, e-commerce platform or the way we do, you know, social media or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it is. And it's, it's a, but it's just put innovation at the center of it that consumers care about. And, yes. and that's, that's the, it's not about, look, operational improvements are important. Why? Because they free up the budget to do the, the exciting stuff. Yes. But where, where a lot of organizations are getting kind of is, is they're looking at the, uh, the operational improvement as the end goal. They're saying mm. we're going to digitally transform and, and our cost income ratio is going to go from X to Y. Woohoo. <laughs> like, yeah. it's, like, it's, it's, we're going to, we're going to do all this automation stuff in the back office because, well, we're, it's going to free up budget that we're going to be able to create something really cool that when you go to work, you go, I work for them. And I'm pretty mm. proud about it. Th- those sort of companies are, are the companies that are going to, to, to win. And it isn't always about technology. It isn't always about mm. the latest, coolest, newest thing. Uh, Brian, thanks so much. Very, very interesting to hear your thoughts on digital transformation. One last question. Where can people find you and connect with you online? Um, probably not Twitter because I'm having loads of arguments with people on Twitter all the time. I, I spend less time there now. Um, but just t- on LinkedIn, reach out to me on LinkedIn. My th- The great thing of having a weird name is nobody else has it. So uh, if you just look me up on LinkedIn, Brian Gorish or Brian Gorish on, on LinkedIn, and uh, I'll be happy to chat. Great stuff. We'll do that. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Cheers. Cool. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information about transforming your marketing career through certified online training, head to digitalmarketinginstitute.com. Thanks for listening.